Hey everybody, I really can't say enough how happy I am and was to be able to see you over Zoom this week. It was so fun to be able to reconnect after such a long time apart. So just wanted to tell you that I'm so grateful for you and, and love you all so much. I am excited for my lesson this week. This week we're going to talk about the theme of hope. And you all know me well enough to know that I love to be silly and goofy, that I like to act, and I like to tell stories. So I'm going to do that this week in a funny way using technology. So please just laugh along with me. I was trying to be fun and funny. We're going to do some time travel, and I'm going to tell you a story that brings me a lot of hope. A story that I expect you'll be familiar with, but I want you to sit in it with me to have it wash over you a new sense of hope. So uh, let's jump in. I'm going to show you a few pictures and ask you a few questions wanting you to get uh, your minds thinking and then we're going to jump into the story. Here is a photo of a boat on Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan is the lake that we can see here from Chicago and it looks like there are some waves. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on a boat before, but when you're on a boat, if it's windy, there's a current that comes that will pull your boat. So even if the motor isn't on, your boat will move. And if there are big waves, you're likely to get splashed and it can be a little scary. There have been many times this year where it felt like I was on a boat. With COVID and the changes that have come, there have been many times where it feels like my boat just can't stay put, that it's always being moved by the current, that my life is changing because of the things that are happening that I, that I can't control. Even there have been moments where it's like I'm sitting on a boat and the waves are too big and I'm getting splashed. I felt scared. I wonder if you've felt similarly. I want you to take a moment to think about the times in the past half year or so where you felt frightened, sad, frustrated, where there was challenge. Think about those things for a moment. What were the moments that happened or the things that happened that made you feel scared, sad, frustrated, or challenged? For the sake of our analogy, the things that you just thought of or maybe wrote down are going to resemble the wind that makes the water move, the things that make our boat go this way and that. I told you I want to talk about hope today. In our analogy, I want hope to be resembled by an anchor. Here's a picture of an anchor. The way anchors work is you take them and throw them off your boat and there is a long rope that's attached to it. So when the anchor drops down into the water and eventually touches the sand, the anchor will help keep your boat in place. So like in this photo, as you see the wind pushing on the boat, it still is going to only go so far as long as your rope is. So even though it might move a bit, your boat will never go too far. In my experience, so often in order to have hope, we need to have good stories to live into that anchor us, that help us stay firm in our hope as life comes at us every which way, making us want to despair. In my experience, this is one of those stories. So I want you to join me in our silly adventure as we travel back in time to hear a story that I think we must know and live into today. Hello, can you see me? This is the strangest thing, but I'm, I'm trusting you can hear and see me. I'm told that I'm supposed to tell you what life is like for me. It's hard to even know where to begin. I'm a Jew or an Israelite. The words mean the same thing. And I live in a region called Galilee in a city named Nazareth. 
you can see as you look around that where I live, I bet looks really different than where you do. The place where I live isn't special. Most people would say it's actually the opposite of special. But I was taught by my family about our ancestors, about people like Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Joshua, and David. Have you heard those names? I learned about how God promised Adam and Eve that one day their descendant would crush the head of the snake while the snake bit the heel of the descendant. I was told about how God promised Abraham and Sarah land family in that one day the whole world would be rescued and blessed through their family about how God promised David that one day from his line the messianic king would come so we've been waiting God did give Abraham and Sarah family and land, but unfortunately we had bad kings who led us astray and eventually into exile. Prophets tried to tell us to repent, but we wouldn't listen. So we were under Babylonian leadership for 70 years, and those 70 years were rough. My family will tell you about it. And then after that, we were able to return, but things still feel like we're in exile. My ancestors rebuilt the temple, learned the law, rebuilt the walls, but we're still under other leadership. Currently, the Romans rule under us, and God hasn't returned to the temple. We are waiting. And the Romans, it's not a party, to say the least. It's challenging being under their leadership. Herod was placed as the puppet king over us, and he calls himself the king of the Jews, but we don't view him that way. He treats us horribly. He taxes us so badly that we can barely even survive. We're waiting for the true king of the Jews. But there is some excitement happening in my life right now. My relative recently became pregnant and she has been wanting a child for so long, but she was barren and her and her husband are old, so we're all shocked. Apparently, the story goes that Zechariah, her husband, who's a priest, was in the temple giving an offering, burning incense, when all of a sudden an angel named Gabriel appeared and told him that his wife would become pregnant and that they were going to have a son and that they should call his name John. And he told Zechariah that many people would rejoice at the birth of their son, that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit, would go before the Messiah to prepare the hearts of Israel for their God, that we would be ready for the coming of our Lord. Are you getting this? It seems like what we've been waiting for is finally coming to pass. And then Zechariah said to the angel, how am I going to know that this is true? My wife is old and I'm old. And Gabriel was upset and said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to you to bring this good news. But since you have no faith, you will be silent until the birth of your son. So he has been silent and people figured out something must have happened. And sure enough, Elizabeth conceived. I know how much she's wanted a child, so I am thrilled for them. And the excitement continues. I am betrothed to a wonderful man. He is kind and trustworthy and honest. And he actually comes from the family line of Abraham and David. I'm so excited to marry him, but I have to tell him some news and I'm a bit nervous. So I'm gonna try to run it past you first to see how it goes. So yesterday, Gabriel actually came to visit me too. Gabriel said, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. With me? And I was troubled and I was trying to figure out what in the world Gabriel was saying and what was happening. And then Gabriel said, do not be afraid, Mary. God has found favor with you. You are going to have a baby and you should name him Jesus, which means God saves. And this baby will be a king like David who will rule over the people forever. So I asked, how is this supposed to happen since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, the same Holy Spirit that brought life and light out of darkness in Genesis is going to generate life inside your womb. God is going to bind God's self to humanity through the conception and birth of the Messiah. 
So I told the angel, I am the servant of the Lord. Do to me as you have said. I still can't believe it. God has looked on me, a backwoods no-name girl, to be the future mother of the king we have been waiting for. I think God is going to turn the world upside down. But now I have to tell Joseph and I'm worried he won't believe me. So, my update. Things didn't go as well as I hoped they would to start. So I told Joseph about me being pregnant and he thought I must have cheated on him. So in our time, women, if they cheated, were supposed to be stoned to death. That meant that people would throw stones at us until we died and thankfully, Joseph is a good man, so he said that he would leave me quietly so that I could live. But while he was sleeping that night, an angel appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. She's telling you the truth. The baby growing in her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus because he will save people from their sins. So when Joseph woke up that morning, he came to me and he said, I remember now, I remember how the prophet said a virgin will bear a child and that they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And he couldn't believe that what the prophet said must be happening now. So he did exactly as the angel commanded and brought me into his home as his wife. Then a decree went out from Caesar Augustus saying that we needed to go back to where our families are from so that we could be registered in a census for taxes. So we had to leave Nazareth in Galilee to go all the way to where David was from, which is a city called Bethlehem because he's from the line of David. The city was so busy and a ton of people were in Bethlehem. And so while we were there, we couldn't find a place to stay. And it came time for me to give birth. So I had our son in a stable and we wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a feeding trough. Now, someone was recently explaining to me that I can do this thing where I share my screen. So I'm gonna to try to do that to see if you can view a few pictures with me. Let's see here. Okay, I hope that this is working. So you can see from this photo that we had to travel from way up north to come all the way down to Bethlehem. And here's the inn where we stayed. It was really simple. And we had some interesting visitors. It was incredible. So these shepherds came to us and they told us that they had been out with their flocks at night. And while they were in the field, an angel came to them and said, a baby has been born this day in the town of David. I'm bringing you good news. Go see the baby for yourself. And afterwards, a host of angels surrounded them and sang glory to God in the heavens and peace to people on earth. So these shepherds came to us and they told us all about what happened. And I treasured these words in my heart. It came time for us to be purified. This is one of the many laws that God gave to Moses when we entered into a covenant with God. It was a way for us to be in relationship with a holy God. So Joseph and I took Jesus to Jerusalem so that we could offer a sacrifice at the temple. Since we were extremely poor, we were to offer two young pigeons or a pair of turtle doves. When we entered the temple, a man approached us. Later, we found out his name was Simeon, and God had promised him that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah with his own eyes. And he approached us and he took Jesus in his hands and he said, God, now I can die in peace. You kept your promise to me. Right now I am seeing the Messiah that you promised to save us. You've given this baby so that the whole world will be rescued and blessed. He will be a light to the nations and glory for your people, Israel. Joseph and I were, of course, astonished. And then he got really close to me and he told me, he said, Listen, your child will be rejected by the very city to which he offers the way of peace, the people who he came to rescue. Then 
a prophetess named Anna came to speak to us. And she was old, about 84 years old, and she'd had a hard life. She, would, she was widowed when she was really young. So she had to work hard to get by in a male-dominated world. And she spent her time praying in the temple and fasting. She never lost faith. And when she saw Jesus and spoke to us, then she left the temple and told everyone who she could find who had been waiting for the redemption about this baby, this Messiah who had come. She was one of the first people to tell the world about this great news. After our visit to the temple, we went back to Bethlehem. Our next visitors were called wise men. They came from really far away in the East. And while they weren't Jews, they knew the Old Testament prophecies and they knew that Balaam had prophesied that one day there would be this Messiah born. And when they saw the star, they followed it. And once they made it to Jerusalem, they began asking if people knew where this baby was to be born. And when Herod heard this, he got really nervous. Remember, he didn't want people to share his power. And he even called himself the king of the Jews. This was threatening to him. And the people in, the, in Jerusalem didn't like it either. This is where all of the elites lived. They benefited from having Herod as the king. So Herod assembled the chief priests and the scribes, and he asked them what was prophesied about where the Messiah would be born. And they told him in Bethlehem, in Judea, the prophet said, and you, O Bethlehem, you are by no means the least of the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So Herod summoned the wise men in secret and told them to go to where the star appealed to go and look and then to come back and tell him where this new king of the Jews was so that he could go and worship him too. So the wise men went and they walked to where the star had its resting place in Bethlehem to us here in this stable. And when they saw our home, they rejoiced with such joy and they entered the house fell down in worship and gave us many great gifts. It was incredible. I still am shocked about who God decided needed to be with us as the Messiah was born. These no-name shepherds, an elderly man, a widow, and these people from the East, people who weren't Jews, surely God wanted the whole world to be a part of this big event. And when it came time for them to leave, God appeared to them in a dream and told them not to go back through Jerusalem, but to go another way. For Herod was not good news. Then God appeared to Joseph in a dream as well and told him to take Jesus and I and to go to Egypt. And sure enough, as we were leaving, Herod began killing all of the babies two years of age and under because he realized that the wise men had tricked him. And he wanted to make sure that this new king, this threat to his kingdom could not survive, that he could continue to be in power. But of course, God had a bigger plan. We stayed in Egypt until God told us we could return. And then we went back to Nazareth to raise Jesus. Hello everyone and welcome back to 2020. I hope that you had a good time with my dear friend Mary as she told you the Christmas story and I hope that there were different parts of it that stood out to you in new and fresh ways. I know that last school year we were waiting for the fulfillment of that promise and we began to explore Jesus and how he is the one who the Israelites had been waiting for, who really did turn the world upside down and still continues to today. Now, I want to emphasize that this is more than just a story, that the things that Mary just told you are true, that they really happened in history, that Jesus did come to earth, God came to earth and lived among us in such an interesting way. And 
what I want to do as I process how this story gives me hope is I want to share with you some of the things that have been hard for me, some of the things that I thought of at the beginning of our time together. And then I'm going to record some of the ways I think that the story uh, speaks to, to those challenges, fears, frustrations, points of sadness. And I hope that then you can do the same thing. So I'm going to share my screen with you. So here are some of the things that I wrote down, things that have been challenging this year. There have been many times I have felt lonely. I don't know if you felt the same. There's been times that finances have felt tight. I know that that's been true for so many families. It's been really heavy. And, and I admit my privilege in this, that a lot of the things I've been sitting in this year haven't been my own struggles, but the struggles of other people who have been oppressed and marginalized. And um, I, I admit the privilege in that, but also uh, a big part of the year for me has been learning more about the injustices and the experiences of people in the margins, people who are Black, people who are immigrants, um, and how our country has really impacted them in negative ways. And so um, I, I termed it as hearing about the suffering of people in the margins and then similarly, digging into the history of our country and who is and who isn't welcome. We have as a country really propped up some people and then really oppressed others. And another thing that I think many people have struggled with in this season are loss of loved ones. And all of these things make the wind feel like it is just beating down on us, that it is powerful and, and sometimes wants to suck us out of hope. Um, so what I want to do is I want to kind of go down the list and say how I see how this story speaks to each of these. So I have felt lonely this year. And one of the incredible things in this story is that God decided to come to earth to live among us. Literally God in God's fullness came as a baby and then lived a human life to be in community with us. Remember, God continues to draw nearer. Now, I've had, you know, financial struggles. Everyone has had financial struggles this year. And I think one of the incredible things is that God decided not to be born to people who we cannot relate to, people who have no financial struggles at all. But instead, Jesus was born into a poor family. I think it's significant that Jesus experienced many of the things that we do too. Now, this one, so I, I said, I heard about, you know, the suffering and it's, and it's really been a heavy journey to um, journey with people who have been in such grieving and mourning and entering into that with them. And I think the incredible thing about Jesus in this story is that he actually experienced this himself, that Jesus, when he was young, was impacted by genocide, that he had to flee a country because of its violence, that he was probably an undocumented immigrant during that time, and that then he had to migrate back to home that he, in his early years, had such upheaval of his life, that Jesus actually has experienced many of the things that maybe you have experienced, your family has experienced, or other people in the margins have experienced. So I'm going to write down that Jesus experienced suffering by needing to flee. Now, once again, this theme of who is and who isn't invited, this is one of the incredible things about this story. The people who we would have, had, would have expected, the rich, the mighty, the powerful, weren't included. Instead, it was the shepherds, the magi, the people from out of town, the elderly, the widow. So we see in the story how God includes all and prioritizes those we would not expect, the poor, the outsider. Now, this loss of loved ones, I think it's a very common experience in this time of COVID. It isn't spoken to exactly as clearly as these others in this story, but I do think it's significant 
that, as we know, that eventually Jesus did die, that he himself lost his own life for others, that he experienced the loss of loved ones. He lost loved ones in his life and ministry, but also that he himself was willing to lose his own life. So we see how Jesus experienced loss by death of loved ones and in his own death. Now, I want you to try to do something similar, just to take a moment to think through what were the things that have been hard for you and how does this story um, serve to be an anchor that it helps to give you hope? For me, this story is incredible because I see how God is not far off that God is not distant, but that instead God really did come and live among us and experience the things that have been hard and heavy, that God understands me, that God understands you. I hope that that can be like an anchor that even as still now, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like the winds are letting up quite yet. The wind is still blasting and we are being moved in the water, but I hope that through this story you can lower your anchor, let it sit in the sand, and that in remembering this story and who God is and how much God loves you, how God experienced the things that you experience that make you feel sad and afraid and frustrated and challenged, that um, it helps you remain anchored to not be able to go too far in your boat to shift too far this way or that but that you can stay um, rooted anchored in in this truth